All right. Here we are. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Twitch stream. Excited uh, to, uh, to, to another day, Wednesday. I guess it's Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? <laughs> I think it's Wednesday. I, I've lost track of most of the days. Uh, welcome to the stream. Um, Steve and I are, are here again today. We're on, uh, on uh, Mr. Isaac's uh, streaming channel. Um, and we're also on the Inside Participate channel. Make sure you're following both of those channels. We got lots of stuff happening on, on both of them that is worth being notified of when it goes live. We're with Dr. Diane Bowser this morning. Uh, Dr. Bowser, welcome to the stream. Thank you for having me this morning. This is my first Twitch stream. I'm so excited. That's it's awesome. Exciting. It is we're, exciting. We're on a roll. We're bringing people into Twitch left and right this week. Uh, yesterday we had Jamie Donnelly, and it was her very first Twitch stream as well. So, uh, you know, welcome. Yeah, we're making we're making things happen. We're bringing everybody into the future, one person at a time. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a great one when everyone's doing professional learning on Twitch. That's our goal. That's um, really cool. Yeah, yeah, we're super pumped. So, um, speaking of being pumped, we're gonna talk about something I know nothing about, but would absolutely love to learn about, which is, listen, um, if there's any reason to do these streams, it's so that just me, I'm just, it's selfish. It's so that I can learn things. Um, uh, so I'm really excited about learning about uh, Blender today. Um, so why don't you um, talk a little bit about what this piece of software is, what it does, and, and then we'll get into kind of the weeds on it, because I think this is super exciting. So Blender, um, the reason I love it and we use it at our company, CodeReel, is because it's open source and it's free. And anyone can access it. And it's a very democratized technology, right? And there are tons of great devoted developers who not only work on the Blender development team in Python. So if you have interest there, I'll take some questions about that later on. But um, there are tons of free add-ons for Blender. And you know, if you've used Maya or ZBrush or any of the other 3D applications, a basic license is somewhere between six and twelve hundred dollars. I was going to say Maya is definitely not free, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so um, previously, there were big differences between Maya and the add-ons available for Maya and the speed with which you could do things for uh, game art and design. AR and VR. We're a little more focused on AR and VR right now, but we're also doing some uh, education simulations and game design. So, um, okay. so we're using it for all three. It's an essential part of our pipeline. And we're just, I mean, I'm just in awe of all the great developers who have built this tool over the last 10 years and have brought it to us um, out of the goodness of their hearts in most cases, just to bring a modeling tool that was like a rival from Maya. So what do you do in Blender? Um, it's almost endless. And right now, I think Blender is in the state where it's becoming all things to all people. Um, Blender is a great, like, basic modeling tool, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today. But I also want to point out that you can do 3D and 2D animation. You can do sculpting and rendering. You can do great commercial product shots. If you have clients that use CAD, you can take CAD models and bring them into Blender and do great product shots for clients. So um, the possibilities are kind of endless. If you're shooting short product commercials for technical objects, this is a great place to visualize them for um, mm -hmm. media. That's so awesome. It's endless. I mean, I could just go on. but. And we have the website up on the screen now, blender.org, if you want to, uh, especially if you want to follow along. I mean, a lot of these streams that we've been doing, um, you can download what we're using because most of the tools we've been using have been free or, or uh, have a trial. And you can actually kind of follow along with us. And we encourage you to do that um, because that's that's kind of kind of the fun part of learning on on a system like this, especially if you have um, uh, two two monitors where you can kind of watch the stream and yeah. and and on the other screen do whatever it is that we're doing at the same time. We encourage you to do that, and definitely we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, you know, uh, pop in the chat, talk about uh, what what you're doing and what you're liking and what's going on, uh, so that we can get those questions to Dr. Bowser. That would be awesome too. Yeah, and if I could give a little context too about one of the reasons I was so excited that uh, Dr. Bowser was going to join us and talk about um, Blender is 
Um, my students, you know, I teach game design and development, and the whole idea of these streams, a lot of it's for, for like Mike said, for Mike and I to learn, but also for my students and the rest of the world. Um, my students, you know, this is a great tool for them to dabble with in terms of animation and 3D modeling, especially those that are interested in getting into using like Unity and Unreal Engine, because once they develop something in Blender, they could bring it right in to their projects. So that's one of the things that has me so excited about the potential here. So there you go. Nice. All right. Uh, Dr. Bowser, why don't, you, why don't you show us a little bit uh, of Blender and you know how it works? Okay, so um, if you've just downloaded Blender and installed it, your screen is going to look a lot like Mr. Isaac's screen. Um, and this is sort of like a standard Blender setup. You open it for the first time and you get the cube. Um, when you see my screen in a, in a second or two, um, mine looks a little more customized, but that's just like the flexibility of Blender. I added some colors to the menus and whatnot. Today, I'd like to show you around and show you about some of the possibilities in Blender and uh, what the various views are. When you open something like this, it just seems so overwhelming with all the buttons and controls, and it's hard to know where to go first. So my goal is to give you a little tour and to answer a lot of questions during the time that we have today. I want it to be all about um, introducing everybody to the wonders of Blender and then some great resources that I'd like to talk about um, as well. But when you open it the first time, um, you see the cube and you have a camera in your view and a light, usually. We're not gonna worry too much about cameras and rendering and things like that today. We're gonna talk a lot about modeling in this cube and what you can do with it because um, there's kind of a joke in 3D modeling. If you see the t-shirts, it always has this basic cube in the middle because <laughs> the starting point for like every project ever. So um, we're going to do a lot with this cube today. And then I hope we're going to get a lot of great questions and comments and, um, you know, responses from everybody on the stream. So you when you open Blender the first time, one of the things I want to point out right away is everything is contained in a scene. So um, it's, they're called collections and you can change you can add scenes up here, but for the most part, when you're just beginning modeling, you're gonna stay in this scene and you're gonna work with objects and lights and uh, animation in a single scene. So no need to be overwhelmed. This file tree works like all the file trees you're familiar with in, on a Windows or a Mac or a Linux machine, right? Um, so I have mine set up a little customized here. I have an environment lighting and a camera rig because I do a lot of rendering for the web. And then I have my objects stacked below. You can organize this any way you like and it's so easy to add a new collection, right? A new category. Um, when you first open Blender the first time, it will ask you if you want to left click or right click. I'm suggesting everybody left click initially in Blender now because it works the same way all of our other imaging software works. So. Um, in order to add a new collection, you would just simply click on the collection button up here and you get a new collection and you can organize your objects accordingly. Let's say you want more than the cube or you want to find out what Blender can do. Um, one of the great things about Blender is you get all these different views, but they're overwhelming at first. I'd like to start out in the modeling view up here. So if you have Blender installed and you're following along, click on the modeling view, you should see your cube and you can zoom in and out with your mouse wheel. I mean, it's just like any other imaging software you might use. If you hold down your middle button, you can sort of pan around and get a good view of your cube. And then I'm gonna show you some cool tricks in a second to change views very quickly. But initially you notice when you open Blender, you're in object mode. And this is the mode where you're gonna do a lot of things when you're beginning to model in Blender. Um, there are other modes we're going to talk about today, and I'm going to show you around. There's edit mode, there's sculpt mode, and then there's some production modes that will just briefly, I'll show you where the resources are and you can explore them after the session today. But in the modeling view and object mode, we're going to select our cube. And I want to show you all of the cool views we can do. These are the numbers at the top of your keyboard or on the side on your number pad. 
So uh, view number one, we're getting a really flat view of our object and we can move it vertically very easily and position it very easily from this view, right? Up here, you'll notice we have some toolbars and that controls what we see in our view. I have something called snapping on up here. So when you click the little magnet, you can snap to this grid, this beautiful grid that you see, and you'll be able to snap to the increments of the grid. And I'm gonna keep this open for a minute. Or an edge of another object, a face of another object, or the volume of another object. And we'll display a couple of those later on. But once I've moved my cube where I want it to be, I just hit enter and now I'm positioned. So this is view number one. It's really good for moving things vertically and horizontally on the X axis. View number two, we're back in sort of 3D perspective mode, right? And we can spin around. We're getting our orientation up here on the top right, right? It's showing us where we are. SketchUp has a lot of uh, views like this too, right? Um, I can go in and out of different perspective moves. We're going from orthographic to, or, orthographic to perspectival. Um, another way to do that in Blender, you can toggle perspective and orthographic very quickly. Mine's kind of slow right now. But I like to use these number keys. So view one, we're getting the flat view. View two, we're back in 3D. We're sort of underneath our object. Let's look at some of the others. View three, we're looking at it sideways on the y-axis now. View four, we're back in 3D. And my other favorite for right now is uh, view seven. We're looking at it from the top down. I'm sorry, could you just show us how again to get to where we can see those different views? Sure, um, so you're in object mode over here. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and like I said, you can always hit your middle mouse button and toggle around, right? That's how I just snap back into 3D view. Okay. Okay. You're going to use the numbers on your keyboard, right? They can, they can be the ones above your letters, your QWERTY letters. Or if you're lucky enough to have a number pad on your keyboard, you can use your number pad, right? And, and so we're just clicking through the numbers. Um, view number one. View number two. View number three is the y-axis. So number one is the x-axis. Number three is the y-axis. And number seven shows you top down. Now the cool thing about any of these views is when you combine it, let's say I'm looking at the top now, but I want to see the bottom of my cube, right? So if I want to look at the bottom of my cube, I just hold shift seven. And instead of taking me to the top, it takes me to the bottom. Oh, on Windows, it's control seven. I'm sorry. So I'm used to modeling on the Mac a lot. And today I'm on the Windows machine. So I'm a beginner too. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, please feel free to stop me if I'm going too quickly. But I just want to show you how to get different views of your object and what you can do with your object. So you have this cube. And um, Mr. Isaacs, maybe you can help me out. Does your class currently do some 3D modeling or is this a first approach? So for my students, a lot of it, uh, a lot of their projects are choice based. So they, the kids that choose to use Unity or Unreal for designing games, they would want to use some 3D modeling. So they all have options to do 3D modeling, but it's really a matter of the kids that are, you know, particularly interested in in it. So it's a it's a, a fraction of my students. Well, so I want to make some modeling fans today. Yeah. And so we're gonna play, we're gonna play with this cube a little bit. Um, this cube is called a low poly model. And many of the game assets we talked about, you know, we're modeling in Blender a lot of times to bring the assets into Unity and use them in games, right? And the reason we like low poly models is they don't take a lot of memory to display or play through in the game, right? So if we're using meshes with a lot of uh, polygons in them, it's really, really, really hard. And I'll show you the difference in a second. Um, 
to have all those assets at one time in the game, right? They're going to suck up a lot of memory. Your game's going to be laggy, right? When, when you're playing a game on Xbox or um, 3D and Steam or something, you always notice when that game lags. And sometimes it's because the assets in that game were built to be beautiful, but not necessarily playable, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit in the context here. Um, our cube is kind of minimalist. It only has six sides. And um, so there's not, there's a lot we can do with it just in this view. I want to show you this cool control and toolbar over here on the left, right? What can we do with this toolbar? Well, we can select things, right? So we can draw a box around the things we want to select. Since I only have one object in the scene, it's not very helpful, but let's, uh, let's put a couple more objects in the scene. So I've duplicated my cube. I hit shift D to duplicate and I duplicated my cube. Now, if I only want to select my original cube, right back over here, I can choose the select tool and just like any other imaging program, draw a little box around my cube. Well, that time I got both of them. Let's see if I can do one. There we go. And now I just have one of the two cubes selected, right? That's pretty cool. Um, Blender's even cooler than that. You have circle select modes and lasso select modes, just like in Photoshop. So I'm assuming that even if people haven't modeled before, they've played in some of these other imaging programs and it's kind of similar. The tool you're going to use most often, often in Blender is this transform wheel. And it's very, very cool. It can scale and move things and rotate them all at the same time. So previously, if you've used any other 3D modeling tool, you have scale, right? And if you still want to do things that way, you can. So scaling makes things bigger or smaller, right? If I want to make this bigger on the x-axis, I can pull out. Now, let's say I want to be very precise about what I'm doing, right? So I'm going to undo that with Control Z. I want to be very precise. I can hit S for scale, and I want to scale it by four times, and I've scaled the whole cube, right? But last time I only scaled along the X axis. So I'm going to undo it again. Let's do it and then undo it. If I want to scale just along the X axis, what I can do is I can hit S for scale. I can hit X and then four that way and scale four meters in either direction automatically. So it, it's the scale tool in and of itself is really cool. And let's do that. And I'm just going to leave it that way for now. So we scaled it along the X axis. Let's say we want to make our cube taller too. We want to bring it up a little bit. Maybe we're building a wall or a building. So one way to do it. And my favorite way, if you're just playing around with new forms is just to drag the handle. Right. But notice we have things above and below the plane now. Right. What do we do? We don't want anything underground. We want everything above on the plane. So I'm going to use some of the view tools I showed you earlier. I'm going to go to view one. Notice how it flattens it out and it shows me my big wall. I'm going to choose the move tool and I'm going to move everything up. And now my building is sitting on the ground plane. All right, so I have this really tall wall I'm building. Now let's say, I, I not only do I want to scale the thing, I want to rotate it too. That's where the combine tool comes in handy. I can scale, notice the scale handles, the move handles are the little arrows, right? So if I want to move along the x-axis, I drag this way. If I want to move along the y-axis, I can drag, in my case, back and forth, right? Because I might be oriented this way. Or I can move up and down, as I've shown. And I, I always like to use those really flat views when I'm moving left to right, if I want to be precise about um, size and modeling. Since we work with a lot of engineering clients, that's kind of a thing. Um, but what else can I do with this? Well, I can also rotate. So if I highlight here, you'll see the little circles on the transform tool, right? I can rotate along the Y axis. I can rotate along the x-axis, which at this point 
is coming toward me, right? We're going around the x-axis. And I can also rotate, which is the way we usually think of rotation in 3D space, on the z-axis. And again, anytime you hit enter, your movement is applied, your, your change, your transformation is applied, or if you click away to another object. Now, my object's running into my camera up here, right? So I want to scale it back down so it's not running into my camera rig. And I'm going to move it back down. So I'm going to lay it on the ground plane, view number one, and I'm going to pull it back down. So those are some of the basics on the toolbar, just moving things around and navigating in the viewport. But can, can you change can can the can you change the color of the blocks like sure <laughs> that's a great question it, yeah definitely you can gray's so, a little boring yeah it is a little boring and um and, and so and initially it's overwhelming and you're just kind of playing and figuring out how you can move in the viewport but let's say um okay we, we got our block we've moved it into place but we want things to be a different color so mm -hmm. let's go up here to the overlays so everybody see where i am on the top right yep and we're going to click on the overlays right and the overlays show us what we're going to see in the viewport right so at this point i have almost everything selected and I'm in solid view mode. So I want to go through some of these views a little bit to, to help with this. Um, we also have wireframe, which is sort of the old 3D modeling way, right? Where you just want to look at the edges of the object. Mm -hmm. In solid mode, if I'd like to change the color of the blocks just to make it easier to distinguish my objects, I'm going to come over here and click on the right. And we can change the color right here. So we can change the color by object and show the object color. I haven't applied any materials or objects to my block yet. We'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. For right now, random makes a lot of sense because the solid view mode will just show us our block and our cube in different mm -hmm. colors. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's cool. We also have two other view modes in Blender, which are kind of miracles in 3D right now. Um, we have something called viewport shading that lets us see our light conditions, right? So I haven't applied any materials or colors to my block. We're going to get into that a little bit next. But um, now I can see my scene lights here. I have a light here and I have a light over here. I can see how they're affecting the objects in my scene, right? So yeah, let's I was going to say it's like it's glowing. Yeah, exactly. And so this is called, um, this is a shaded view, right? Um, this is really great. Viewport shading allows you to see if your lighting placement and your setup, especially if you're going to render or do product shots or kind of uh, show a character or a game object in its best possible light. This view allows you to really set your lights so that they highlight your object. So let's say I don't like the way that, I mean, this is like pretty glowing and um, this light's a little too bright. Notice as soon as I selected the light over here on the right, we have an entirely new tool interface, which I'm going to get into in a minute, but it selected my light, my lighting interface. And I have a point light on my light is a thousand Watts, right? So, Maybe it's just too bright. I'm going to click in there and I'm going to make it 500 watts. Maybe that's better. Notice some of that glows come off the object. Same thing over here. I could select my other light. It's at 1,000 watts. Um, I can also change the color of my light, which I think is super cool. Um, let's say I want to put a nice warm light on it, maybe even warmer than that. Right Now I have a colored light. It's a thousand watts, not such a big effect yet. If I move it down and maybe closer to my object, I might see a little bit, but my object doesn't have a lot of color. There's not, there's no big floor object to reflect off of yet. So we're not really seeing the effects of colored light, but this is where you would change those things. Again, if you wanted to introduce color into your scene, you also have the option of changing your light type, which is really neat. 
point lights work really well when you're modeling and designing because they don't take up a lot of memory. More complex lighting tools, like the sun tool, notice when I choose sun, I get this big sun ray and I can point it at my object. So all I would do, notice when I hover over, I can change the direction of that sunlight. That's pretty cool, right? Wow. And move it up a little bit, maybe move it down through my object in a different way. Like I only want it to glance by, right? Um, I can have a spotlight. Notice my spotlight shows me the silhouette of my spotlight. So I can control how wide that radius is and I can control the radius, the spot shape, put it at a custom distance, right? So the settings are endless. Endless. And, and it's worth noting that this is in a 3D space. So you can like pan around this and see how that spotlight is. Yeah, see? So when you pan around, you can see that where that spotlight is actually pointing. That spotlight is actually pointing away from the block. Uh, right. even though in, in the one view, it almost looked like it was it, like in at, at a certain angle. It looks like it's pointing over top of the block, but it's actually not. It's actually pointing right. away from the block. Uh, but because this is a 3D space, you can actually, you know, spin your camera around and and view of this. Um, we had a couple questions in the chat that are kind of interesting. Um, you know, I guess, what do you think the, the learning curve on something like this is, especially for students, especially for like upper elementary or, or high school students? Do you think like, for example, a, a grade nine or 10 student could figure this out? I mean, we know that there are special ones that will like, boom, and they got it, right? We all know those kids. We've all kind of a lot of us have taught those kids but but if we wanted this to be like a regular part of like what we're doing in our class especially like a, a class like Steve's where he's actually doing you know game design and content creation um you know what do you think the learning curve is how long do you think it takes for someone to be able to like just figure out the basics like this so if you're figuring them out on your own, I have a whole list of resources I want to get to. Right. Um, but for younger younger students, that might not be an option, right? It might be harder to follow tutorials. But I also don't want to underestimate the younger students because they play in 3D game environments. And so once you show people how to move around this viewport area, right? This 3D modeling space is called the viewport area. I think the learning curve um, flattens a lot once they realize how much it is like navigating in a game environment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, it's hard to estimate for any one individual, but I would say within a couple of weeks, people are pretty comfortable getting in here and, um, you know, picking mesh objects. And I just want to show all of the cool objects we could add, right? So over here on the object menu, if we selected, um, I want to add a mesh, right? All of these different meshes we can add and people start to play with those and become more comfortable very quickly. Yeah. So younger students, I mean, they have gaming, valuable gaming experience that I, I don't want to devalue, right? It comes in handy here immensely as they learn a tool like this. For students who are in high school, I think it's just a matter of playing with it consistently every day. So my guess is if you had a class and you were doing this with your class, let's say you were devoting three weeks to this, right? The first week would kind of be that learning curve and everybody would be getting in and exploring the things that interest them most um, once they learn how to navigate in the viewport like we've done during the first part of the session. But after that point in time, once people learn how to move around and maneuver it's sort of like a hockey stick they start discovering all of the great features of blender which i hope i can whet your appetite with a little bit today. i'll share yeah, there, there's, little your, bit. there's your daily lesson that the video games have transferable skills by the way as well yeah i'll share a little bit about my experience too with my students um so last semester i had a, a student who in particular wanted to learn Blender because he wanted to create the models for his game in Unity. Um, now, one of the things about, for me, teaching game design is I like to, to um, really leverage the idea of design teams and such. So in this case, this kid clearly 
dug in and wanted to make you know uh, you know the skeletons and, and the, the the moving you know bone structure and, and all that. So he spent probably every day in class working in Blender, which was perfectly appropriate because he you know created a team where his teammate was in Unity developing the world, the environments, and the fixed objects and stuff in Unity. So it became a thing where he was building and transferring that over. Um, I'm sure there are some areas where there are simple things that people could make in Blender that because they're the one also bringing it into Unity to function in the game, it serves as a great tool for that. But uh, but this kid was taking a much deeper dive. So I think it's interesting to see, and that's where that choice idea comes in so handy. Like, I don't think this kid originally knew that he was so interested in 3D modeling or um, Blender in particular, but it became so important for him to achieve what he wanted in that game that that was the, you know, you know his complete focus. So, you know, I, I think it's kind of like a lot of these things, probably low floor, high ceiling, like you could do some fairly simple things like you and I after this might could probably build a couch and bring it into our world in Unity or something. But the kid who wanted the uh, the the actual model that was going to move and be animated in Unity, you know, was a much different story. Right. And, and what I want to do is I want to kind of this is like a buffet. I want to show you a little bit of everything um, to get you excited about going in here to, to explore on your own. So like, just keep throwing the questions at me and we'll move around a little bit. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, though, is over here on the toolbar, because this is where a lot of the magic of Blender is, right? Um, over here, you have your transform tools and your render your scene tools right everything you would use to render or take a picture of the model that you have and again we haven't gotten into the camera views or anything yet but um this is where you make things look kind of pretty and beautiful like they do in 3d game environments right so ambient occlusion is your light and shadows bloom is sort of the glow of the object itself notice when i turn those two things off all of those cool lighting effects just disappeared, even though we're in viewport shading, right? Um, turn them back on and we get a more realistic view of what things look like under light. So that's pretty huge. If we're going, let, let's say we've built this model and it, it's as gorgeous as we've ever wanted it to be and we're ready to output it. Over here, the little button that looks like a printer, right? This is how we would render our scene. Notice I have mine set up for an HD screen, right? So real simple HD rendering. Um, I want to render my things at 100%. I want everything to be at scale, right? My aspect. And, and I can set animation frames, which I hope we're going to get to today. If not today, maybe another time. Um, I've chosen, when I do animation, I like to do it at 24 frames per second because it's kind of old school and I like the way it looks. But certainly you can click on the drop down and use some other kind of uh, common frame combinations that are more akin to what, what would be coming off your phone or a video camera. You can even do some slow-mo right at 60 frames per second up here if you're so inclined. Um, if you're super technical and you understand camera settings, right, you can be super geeky about it and choose the fractionals. Um, but I like to keep it kind of simple and I can add 24 is pretty good now um, so to figure out how long my animation would be. So if you notice, I have 24 frames per second. I have mine set to 250 frames. So I'm doing about 10 seconds of animation when I do, uh, you know, like really basic rendering. So these are my default settings. That's another thing I want to show you in Blender that's super cool. Uh, the settings. We're, we're going to come back to this toolbar in a second, but I don't want to miss this in today's session. Um, over here on the edit menu, right, you have preferences at the bottom. And again, like all the other imaging programs, but Blender preferences are really cool. Let me pull them over here for my other monitor. Blender preferences give you endless customize, customization and endless opportunities to add add-ons to your tool set and my add-ons you can see over here they're kind of filled out here on the side right these are tabs i can click on for example i have something for 
animating ca characters called cats, right? And so I'm looking at that. Um, that's an add-on. But if we go back to the preferences, I just want to kind of give you a quick, like, look what you can do. Look at the preferences. Um, you can change your Blender theme. This is how I changed all the colors in my theme to blue. Um, one by one, you can drop through. I'll show you my user interface really quickly. Um, maybe my text or my menus, right? And you can see the color settings. You can see, you know, there's my blue color. So if you really want to customize your environment, that's cool. You can change what your viewport looks like, right? Um, again, I keep mine with the defaults most of the time unless something isn't working, right? And then I go back and look and see if there's an, e an easier setting on memory or an easier setting on rendering or something. Um, you can have light sets that you import, right? So you can set up studio lights in another 3D program and import them here, or you can install pre-made lighting setups, which is really cool. And again, there's a whole community of people who design these things for free, right? There's a site called um, hdridepot.com or something, and they have all kinds of free studio lights and HDRI setups. HDRIs are just high definition photos that you can use as a background. And again, um, that's just a whole world to explore. Um, the other thing I want to point out really quickly, because I don't want to be pedantic about it and go through every one, are the add-ons. Blender comes with a lot of add-ons that aren't turned on initially. And you can go in here and turn them on. So I have add-ons from the official community, from the official like Blender release, from the community of developers. And I'll take add-ons that are in testing, because I like to play like right at the cutting edge of design and modeling. So I'm pretty open to add-ons that are still in development. And you can see my Cats Blender plugin right there, right? That's the one I sh I'm showing over here, right? And I can update it in Blender, which I obviously need to do. Um, some of the tools that I use all the time measure it, right? Because I'm working with CAD people and I have to have very precise drawings and I have to make sure when my CAD comes over, I can measure everything to make sure I'm getting nice one-to-one -one renders. Sometimes when CAD comes over, it comes over 10 times bigger from CAD than it is in Blender when Blender imports it. So you have to change the scale of your rendering and measure it really helps with that. There are also extra objects that you can add, curve tools for more advanced kind of objects, um, and, and on and on and on. There are mesh tools, there are animation tools, Right. So if you're into rendering animation, there are cameras and rigs you can bring on um, if you like to render and animate things. Uh, there are lots of development tools. And then there are the import and export tools, which I think are the most valuable here. And this is why I wanted to show it. If you're bringing things from other software, like I'm bringing things from architects a lot. Right. So I have my Autodesk turned on on my Mac installation all the time because I'm always bringing over architectural drawings and I need those Autodesk imports. So I have this turned on normally in my uh, Mac installation. I can also import or export paper models, right? I love doing 3D paper models. And so I can make like a really complex paper plane or fold it that I've seen somewhere else in Blender. And then I can export it and send it out and render it and send it out with like all the little dashed lines for folds and so on and so forth. You can also export and import uh, for 3D printers, models. Here's my AutoCAD and brushes and things for drawing. So th there's just an endless world here. I don't want to bore you with it. Um, one of the last things I want to show today in, in a little bit of detail are the materials, right? Um, Mr. Isaacs, you noted already like the, the cubes and the blocks are kind of boring, right? With no color and no view on them. So I wanna show you how to apply some materials to your object before we go today. Um, I, if I'm moving too fast, just slow me down a little bit. Um, Blender is in the process of doing a new release every three months and they're making these materials and nodes better and better and better um, with each release. So what I show you today will be better by May. Uh, when the 2.83 release comes out. Um, so 
again, lots of things to deal with nodes and objects. If you played with other 3D modeling software, you may know a little bit about node materials and so on. But I'm just going to give you a brief overview today to show you some of the possibilities. And again, um, Blender will automatically save everything you change down here at the bottom of the preferences window. You can save preferences. You can have it auto save. I have mine auto save, right? Because sometimes I forget and I close the window. But um, it's a great customizable tool. And I just kind of want to point that out. So let's say I built my wall and I'm pretty happy with the way it looks. I'm not super thrilled about um, the Z rotation here. So I'm going to go up. I can transfer on my object here too. If you want to be completely precise, notice this is the location of my object. It's right on the center point of X and Y. So it's not moved at all. It's at zero, zero. And it's two meters up from below the ground plane, right? It's sitting right on the ground plane. Let's say I don't like the Y rotation on my object, right? I want to like keep this object unrotated. I can come back in here and I can change this to zero. And just like in all other text box entries on the web or in any other imaging program, you can tab through these choices and just change it all to zero again. And there you are. My, my wall is sitting upright, right on the origin point. Every object in Blender has an origin. This is the little yellow dot you see here. You can move your origin around. You also have a 3D cursor. I don't know if that's easy to see on my screen, so I'm going to go to kind of object view where it's a little easier and the lights aren't overwhelming. But you have a 3D cursor and you have an origin. Let's say you want to put those two things together. There are so many things you can do up here in the view menus, but you're going to go to object, right? And in this case, I want to bring my origin to my 3D court cursor. So I'm going to snap. I've selected my cube and I'm going to snap my origin, right? Or set my origin up here to the 3D cursor. So that's a new menu choice, set origin. It used to be on the snap menu. Every release is new. Notice how my origin move down. So now when I rotate this object, it's going to rotate around the origin down here. So if I rotate it on the Y axis, notice it's rotating a bit differently, right? We can see that from another angle, rotating on the Y axis. That origin has moved from the center of the object down to where the 3D cursor is, which is right at the origin of the world, right? The origin of the world is at the intersection of the X, Y, and Z. Um, vertices here, right, right here. Now let's say I just want to quick click into a view. I want to see it from the X axis, right? This is a lot like unity. You can click on the axes up here. I want to see it from the Y axis. If I want to go back into 3D view at any time, all I have to do is hold down my middle mouse button and pan around. Okay, let's get into some of the cool things on the toolbar over here. So I have my wall selected. We're just in solid view, right? We've randomly colored our objects. I'm going to go back up to viewport shading to show you some of the cool things we can do over here. So we're in a world, right? We're in a 3D world. We can change our world properties. Right now, I'm using like the standard, you know, sort of gray world where I see my three axes and I have the grid on the floor. Um, if I wanted to change the color of my world, right, <laughs> color my world, old tune, um, music humor, right, I can change the color of my world. Right now, it's not going to matter because I don't have too many objects in there for it to reflect off of. But now I... I'm in sort of a green lit world with no background, no color. If I wanted to really change my background, I could use nodes and add a background image. This is really cool. So let's say I want to put a background image in. Um, I would click on the little circle besides, beside background. And then I could choose a shader or I could choose a background image and 
I can drag an image into here or I can use a mix shader. I can, emission is really cool. You see this all the time in games, right? Um, I can change the color of the emission. I can change the strength of that emission. And if I had other things in here for it to reflect off of, we would get a lot of color, right, coming off of this right now. But that's not the most exciting thing. This little square are the properties of my object that you also see reflected up here. So it's kind of redundant, but there's even more you can do down here, right? You can control motion paths if you're animating. You can tell it how you want it to animate only in range, right? What kind of path are we gonna have in range or can it go off screen? Um, you can determine the visibility of different things in your view and you can determine how your viewport display looks and how much of that you render, right? So if I wanted to also show the wireframe on my object, notice I click on wireframe. I'm not in wireframe mode up here, but now I'm showing the wireframe over my object. That's pretty cool. And then there's a beautiful thing in Blender called modifiers. Um, I, I think we could spend all day in here. I'm going to go back to the viewport and get rid of the wireframe. I want to show you some of the modifiers. So again, I have my sort of, um, you know, elongated cube. I'm calling it a wall. I'm going to uh, set my rotation back to zero. So again, I'm just going to tab through, set everything back to zero. And I'm going to play with some of these modifiers. Blender has so many built-in modifiers, I can't imagine exhausting them all, right? But some of the ones that I use every day, one of the first things I use if I want to sculpt and I want to make a more complex object, I use something called subdivision surface. And I'll show you what that does in a second. So I had my cube. <laughs> Notice my cube is now like some weird shape jewel or gem, right? Nice, yeah. And uh, right away, what's it doing? It's subdividing the planes of the cube, right? And notice I can determine how much subdivision occurs here in the modifier. So in my viewport, I'm only showing one subdivision. If I rendered this, I would show two. That's kind of confusing when you're a beginner. So I always keep these two numbers the same, right? And, and you notice the shape has changed. I'll show you how much it has changed. I'm going to go from object mode to edit mode and you can see i started out with the big wall the big cube right and in a sense blender still sees it as taking up that space but i have this little modifier on it and this modifier is giving me more planes to work with right so in edit mode i can see all of these planes in the modifier right and i can start selecting faces of my object i can start selecting edges of my object. And again, I had a wireframe view increases on it. So let's keep it super simple. Um, but I can start selecting my object and modifying things in my object. Notice when I select a vertice, it selects a vertice of the original object because I haven't applied my modifier yet. So let's go back over to object mode. Let's make this the strange little gem that it is. We're going to apply this. And again, you can do simple or you can do um, a little more creative smoothing Cat Clark subdivision. So I'm going to apply that. And now my object really is this gem, this multifaceted gem. So when I go back to edit mode, and again, another way to get to edit mode, I can go up here and I can choose edit mode. That's the simplest way. And the way I would advise if you're a beginner, notice the meshes around my gem now. Yeah, yeah. And I'm in vertice selection mode, right? I can select vertices, I can select edges, or I can select faces. So when you're initially exploring this, I'm in edge selection mode, right? You can hold down the shift key and select multiple edges. And you'll pull them out or whatever. Right, and I can extrude them. So I can go back to my transform control. Notice it's still over here on the left. And I can scale those edges and pull them out. Notice it's kind of pulling on the faces and the surfaces too, right, when I do that. Because those vertices are attached to other edges and faces. I can extrude 
over here I have a ton, a ton of options. I can extrude, I can inset faces. So let's look at some of those. I, I'm I, actually I'm actually curious about so we have a gem now and mm -hmm. it's but it but it's still like um it's it's gray or I, I guess you you've high or you've uh um you know turned the layer off or whatever but you added like a greenish bluish color to it. Uh I'm I'm curious if um can you add textures to this? So could you sure. make this like look like a diamond like or like like even like for the purpose of a demo add like it so it looks like a piece of grass or something like that like is there a way to add textures in blender sure and and, and so let me go there very quickly i realize our time is running out like i said i'm so excited about these tools i can get carried away <laughs> um and i apologize so what we did with viewport shading is we just told it to give some random colors right these these colors are just random for our viewport so that we can tell our two objects apart yeah. Um, they're not yeah. really attached to this object. If we want to attach some materials to our object, we come yeah. over here to what I'm calling the magic toolbar. I think this is like all the magic of Blender is right here, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to go over and I'm going to click on the little thing that looks like a warning sign at the bottom. These are materials, right? And we want to add some materials. So I'm going to go back into viewport shading mode so we can see what we're doing. We can see what we're adding. And again, I'm still in edit mode up here, but I, I could be in object mode as well, right? So let's keep it simple right now. Let's go back to object mode um, in the material view. I'm going to add a new material. Notice it just gives me like some generic material. There's nothing there yet. Notice its base color is white and it has a shader, right? So this is the most basic kind of material. We're just going to give it some color right now. So again, I, I don't want it to be like glowing white. Um, if I want a gem, maybe I want it like a goldish color, right? Maybe a goldish green. So all I'm doing is I'm changing the base color right here. I'm using a really basic shader. Notice my shader has all kinds of crazy settings, right? So if I want that gold color to be more metallic, I can just crank the metallic view up. Notice what it does to my lighting. And I, it looks a little more metallic, right? I'm right. getting yeah. a little more reflection there. Um, I can have a subsurface color. So let's say I wanted my, su my subsurface color of my gem to be a little pinkish, right? It's sort of a pink diamond subsurface. And again, I don't have a lot to reflect off of. So it's not making a huge difference in this view but I can control all of those things. Now I decide, ah, not so metallic, maybe more rough, right? I'm gonna turn up the roughness and make this thing really rough, or I'm gonna make this thing really smooth and shiny. Notice what happened right away when I made, I turned down the roughness to zero, right? Now it's very reflective. What you're seeing up here are reflections. Oh, that's, that's rad. Yeah, I think one of the comments in the chat that's really interesting and something I resonate with quite a bit is the idea that um, for my students and I and I taught younger kids so so I, I taught like grade six sevens and eights so this is where I would um, get them into something like this and and in a lot of cases they um, uh, just wanted me to to like make something so like make a scene with some grass and a tree and maybe a person or whatever and then you know, then let them go and play and let them kind of loose and experiment. And then, um, and then, you know, if they have more questions later, certainly, certainly having enough knowledge about the tool that I can help answer those questions. But, but, uh, a lot of kids are motivated by, you know, and we're leaving people with about, we're, you know, we have about three or four minutes left. And, you know, so we've we've actually left them in a pretty cool place because now, you know, on the screen, we're looking at, you know, uh, we turned a, a pretty boring gray block into a, a really neat looking, shiny kind of gemstone um, in, in the tool. And that's that's a really neat place to end. We, we did have uh, a question, and this is actually a really good place to end, um, is is where can people get um resources what websites can they go to what blogs or you know where are your kind of top three places that people can go to to learn um youtube channels wherever um that people can can get some instruction on how to do this going forward 
Okay, so um, I've sent Mr. Isaacs a whole list of great resources over, and I'm hoping he'll be able to post them in the channel. But I, I'm going to show you a couple of my favorites right away and what they offer uh, to close. So the best place to go and to start your explorations is at blender.org, right? Um, blender offers a lot of demo files and it, from the download screens, they'll give you a lot of support. Um, you can learn so much just in the Blender community. So if I, if you click on the support at the top, here is the huge list of resources, right? And it's always kind of endless and overwhelming. The things I would recommend are the free tutorials to get started, right? So this is from the support menu, uh, the free tutorials. Um, of course, there are like all kinds of paid resources you can use, but the Blender community is just amazing. And that's what I want to show you. The Blender community has a set of pages that they put together for people with all different kinds of interests, right? So Blender today is, you know, user submitted content, tutorials, live streams, people who are on the same path that you're on, learning how to develop games. Um, there's a Blender chat server. Certainly I'd be selective about that. There's something called right click select, which I inc I love incredibly because you can make suggestions to B Blender developers and they really develop this stuff. Like if a suggestion gets enough votes, that becomes a new feature in Blender. And all of the 2D animation that's been put into Blender over the last couple of years has come from this right click select slide. Um, Blender has a Discord um, and again, some other resources here. And this is what the Blender community looks like when you go in there. Notice you get all of the pages on one page, right? I'm in the Blender Today interface and I'm looking at an experimental version of Blender, which you can also download from the download page at the bottom. Um, I'm looking at something called face sets. So we can apply materials and colors very simply to groups of faces together, right? So from the little bit we did today, we didn't get too far into that, but you can see how if you were building a character like this guy, right? You might wanna put some clothes on him and some different textures and so on and so forth. So um, this is a little demo about what face sets can do made by a Blender user. And of course there are also formal courses. Um, there's, an, there's a site called academy.cgboost.com and he has an intro course that I'm kind of showing here. I was playing with it before we got on today. So I'm on lesson three just to see what it's like. And I think it's really cool. Um, I always like to play with the learning resources and suggest to others. Um, so this course is totally free and you can get in there and really learn a broad overview of which I was only to, able to scratch the surface today in an hour. Now, was are those resources, because I was looking at the document that I just shared, um, I don't see the Discord link in there, or did I miss it? Was that no, it? the Discord link isn't in there. It's on the site. Like, I, So I gave you the Blender community okay, and perfect. this page, right? And it's right here. So if you want awesome. to join the Blender Discord, I'm on the Blender Discord. It's helpful. <laughs> Right? You, if you're having a problem with some feature in Blender, you might not be the only person and you go into the Blender Discord and you can kind of see either A, they're working on it, two, you're making them aware of it. Yeah. Or you know, three, you go up to right click select and say, we really need this thing in Blender. Um, for me, it was like all this CAD import and simplification of CAD, right? Cool. And, and that course you were just showing, is that in that document or in this community link? I just want it to is sure. not. It, it's something I found after I sent that over to you. Okay, um, do you have a link? Can you um Sure, I'm gonna that? post that in our chat. I'll post okay. it overall chat, right? And um, let's see. Let's see if this works. You guys can tell me right away so I can get some feedback. Um, I'm going to post it in the live comments and then maybe somebody can uh, let me know if it's working. Oh, I don't see I have. Okay, I, I'm going to post it in the private chat. Uh, and then maybe you can check it out and post it. Oh, it did not take that. And I apologize. I'm, I'm not regularly on the Windows machine all the time. So I may be slower than regular Windows users. Uh, but yeah, let me post it. 
the other the other place um just we do we do have to go but one of the other places that we're, we might be able to um you know twist uh dr bowser's arm to post resources on is the new game-based learning community at participate so we'll uh if you actually go down in, uh, on the inside participate twitch stream profile uh down the page a little bit is kind of our links and you'll see uh, our communities, and there is a link to the game-based learning community that's brand new, just launched over the last couple of days. And that would be a really cool place to share out some of these resources on the on the participate game-based learning community. We are going to be back later this afternoon, three o'clock this afternoon. We're going to kind of do some of this all over again, share uh, share some more of this stuff and uh, and dig into it a little bit more. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bowser for uh, joining us. Uh, please, again, be sure to follow us on the Twitch uh, channel Inside Participate. Uh, we've been chatting in the chat, so just click on uh, one of our profile names and go ahead and follow us there. Follow Mr. Isaacs on his Twitch stream. And uh, thanks, Dr. Bowser. We'll see everybody later this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me.